about John Ball. So, um, so it's, about about the <laughs> it's a great pleasure to have him here. And uh, let me say a few things about him. So he began his career at Harriet Watt uh, before moving to Oxford in 1996 as a Sedlium professor of natural philosophy. And in 2018, he returned to Harriet Watt, uh, where he currently is. He is a former president of the International Mathematical Union and a member of the executive board of the International Council for Science. He was awarded the von Karman Prize in 1999 and King Faisal International Prize in 2018. Um, his mathematical interests are in nonlinear elasticity, calculus of variations, and infinite dimensional dynamical systems. And as a, result, as a result of his work, we understood mechanics of materials much better. He developed techniques in the calculus of variations in order to show for the first time that the equilibrium equations of nonlinear elasticity for hyperelastic materials has solutions. So his other contributions include theory of cavitation in solids, phase transformations in solids, and liquid crystals. Right. Um, uh, apart from being a great mathematician, he's a great supervisor to many PhD students as well. And um, he's still supervising PhD students in Harriet Watt, which is another main contribution, in my opinion, to mathematics of, uh, of him to mathematics at an international level. And in fact, he was awarded the Sylvester Medal in 2006. And I'm quoting for his seminal work in mechanics and nonlinear analysis and his encouragement of mathematical research in developing countries. So I think that's very important. And um, I couldn't not say he is the president of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. <laughs> so it's a great pleasure to have John Ball with us today, and he will talk about image comparison via nonlinear elasticity. Thank you very much, Yasmin, and thank you for the invitation to speak here. So I'm going to well, I've begun dabbling in computer vision. So. I understand almost nothing about computer vision, uh, but next week I'm going to be in Sardinia for my first computer vision conference, so I hope that I don't get savaged. But um, anyway, this is joint work with Chris Horner, and at least the paper from this was accepted by this meeting in Sardinia, so, and it's already been published, which is very different from what would happen in, in mathematics, you know, they published the proceedings before the conference. Okay, so, um, Here we go. Which of these images are the same? Well, this, this the first one. This is a picture of Edinburgh Castle uh, and the and the old town, the camera obscura, and just there. So, is that the same image or is it a different image? Because there's no right, there's no right or wrong answer to this question. It's you know either yes, it's either the same image because but it's just rotated or. Or it's, or it's a different image because it's irritated, right? And uh, and there's, okay, so this is just reduced in size. So is that the same image or is it a, a different image? Again, you can either answer. Now, now what about this? It's a delay, interesting. Okay, so now imagine that this is a, a postcard of Edinburgh and you put it on the table and you, you photographed it from the side, all right? So it would look like that. So is that the same image or is it a, a different image um, and um well that's clearly a different image right because it's been being distorted but on the other hand it's there's some comparison to be made between the between the two images so i'm going to be talking mostly about that now uh it yes. now something else you might want to do is you might be interested in castles for example, okay, so so you have a you have a picture of a castle there, okay, and you want to look for it in this image. Okay, so you, you try to look for it and, and you search around until you until you find it. All right, so you want to know whether there's a there's a castle there somewhere. Or not. Okay. Right, so what's an image for me is going to be a pair P consisting of an open subset omega of Rn, some some bounded Lipschitz domain, and a, and a, and an intensity map. So a map that takes you from omega to some say Rm, which will give you. I mean, it might m might be one, in which case it might just be a grayscale, or it might be uh, different colors, or it might be some other features of the image you might want. 
So that's what an image is going to be. And um, so n, n equals two would be a sort of photograph, n equals three maybe a tomogram, n equals four might be a dynamic tomogram. I don't know whether larger n could be relevant for sort of continuum approximations to data clouds, perhaps, I don't know. Uh, so you might think of that as some kind of continuum. Um, of course, there's lots of, there's lots of ways of looking at data clouds and cluster analysis, persistent homology, and so on. Okay, now the, the object of the exercise for me is going to be to compare two images, so P1 and P2. I'm going to do that by means of a, of a nonlinear elasticity based functional. And um, so there's all sorts of other approaches using machine learning and neural nets, optimal transport, fluid flow, and, and so on. Now, the, in, in the computer vision literature, there are models based on linear elasticity. They're, they're quite common. Uh, Nonlinear elasticity is, is, provides a conceptually clearer and more general framework. And one key thing is that it, it respects rotational invariance. So, if you know about linear elasticity, it's not a special case of nonlinear elasticity. It's a, it's a linearization of nonlinear elasticity. And so, in particular, it linearizes rotations. So, All right, and so there are, well, this is just a list of the sort of, uh, well, th th these are these are more or less a complete list of, of, of people who use nonlinear elasticity models in computer vision. So right, it's a handful, I guess, of, of people who take this eccentric approach. Okay, so we're going to look for. Um, so I always I don't know how to get rid of this thing at the top. But anyway, uh, we're going to look for invertible maps y that take omega one to R n, which map omega one onto omega two. Okay, they've got to be invertible. And somehow we're going to look for optimal such maps. Okay, and so the, the optimal ones are going to minimize this energy. So we integrate uh, over omega one a function of c that depends on c one of x. That's the, the the feature map or the intensity map corresponding to the first image. C two of y of x because c two is defined on, on omega two, right? And the gradient of y of x. So that's uh, so the gradient of y of x is an n by n matrix. It can be identified with an n by n matrix. So. Um, so the, the, the integrand of C is going to be defined on Rm cross Rm, that's for C1 and C2, and then uh, cross uh, n by n matrices with positive determinant. Okay, so that's my notation for this. Okay, so now an important point is that we, we don't specify what y is on d omega, d omega 1 only that y of omega one is omega two. So, uh, so therefore you allow, you allow sliding at the boundary. So um, we should allow better representation of boundary features. So if you had a sort of house on the, on the edge of the, of the, edge of the um, first image and it was just shifted up a little bit in the second image, then uh, sliding at the boundary would, would give you a sort of better comparison. Okay, it is, it's not typically done in the computer vision literature, but it's considered in the context of elasticity or some version of elasticity in an interesting paper with Farnich and Benin. Okay, so there's the energy again. So we're, we want to minimize this for invertible maps y1 onto omega, <coughs> y, y taking omega 1 onto omega 2. So first thing to ask is what sort of would be reasonable properties of C. And so uh, the first is sort of invariance under rotation and translation. So uh, if you've got two images, say P, which is omega C, and P prime, which is omega prime C prime, we're going to say that they're equivalent, P is equivalent to P prime, if they're related by a rigid translation and rotation. So that omega prime is E of omega. So E is a, a, a um, a proper rigid transformation, so the form a constant vector plus a, a rotation, so an R and S O N times X, it's rigid rotation. So 
Omega prime has got to be E of omega 2, uh, e, e of omega, and C prime of E x has got to be C of x. So, so that's uh, an equivalence relation on images, if you like. And uh, what we want is that, um, that if P1 is equivalent to P1 prime and P2 is equivalent to P2 prime and the corresponding rigid transformations are E1 and E2, then we want that uh, I of P1, P2 of Y is going to be I of P1 prime, B2 prime of the, of the relevant post Y. C2 composed with Y composed with E1 inverse. And if you write that down in terms of the integrals, here it is. Uh, uh, so um, uh, you, you get that, um, that, um, that, that, that this integral with an R2 and an R1 transpose has got to be the same. Okay, so... And so now if you if you want that to hold for uh, all C1 and C2, well, you could take C1 and C2 constant, for example, uh, or put epsilons in front of them or something. And, uh, and so, uh, so in fact, this holds for all P1 and P2 and invertible Y, if and only if of C of C1, C2, QAR is of C of C1, C2. Okay. So what that means is that you're in, um, with respect to the gradient, you're in the realm of isotropic uh, nonlinear elasticity. So uh, and um, and and so and and so it, it's isotropic. It's, it's well known from nonlinear elasticity that uh, the one way to represent an isotropic energy function is as um, a symmetric function of the singular values of the matrix A. So A stands for the gradient. The the singular values of the square roots of A transposed A. And um, so, so our, our condition is, is satisfied if you can write it as a function of C1 and C2 and V1 up to Vn, and it's invariant to, per to permutations of the V1 up to, to Vn. So that tends to be a, a convenient way of representing things. And furthermore, we're going to require that that if C is zero, if and only if C1 is C2 and A is a rotation. So um, that's going to mean that it's going to be zero when, um, when, when images are equivalent. So, so, uh, so it's zero for some Y with Y of omega one is equal to omega two, if and only if P1 is equivalent to P2. And the only sort of non-trivial sort of point about this is that if, if this, energy is zero, right? That means that the integrand with dy of x here has to be uh, uh, zero for all x. So that means that dy of x has to be a rotation for all x. And it's an interesting theorem that if you have well, some, some kind of regularity on, on y, if you have a, 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 a deformation y whose gradient is a rotation for all x, it's a constant rotation. The rotation has to be a constant. Okay, so and so therefore y of x would be a plus r of x, and you and you'd get that um, p one is equivalent p two. Okay. Now another condition that you might want to have, or you might not want to have, depending, is that the energy is invariant to uh, swapping images. Okay, so you might want that. I of P1, P2 of Y is I of P2, P1, and of course the, map, the corresponding map would be Y inverse, going from uh, uh, omega 2 to omega 1. So you might, you might want to require that. You, if, you're, if you're looking, if, if, if the first image was, say, a template, and you were looking so of a castle, say, and you were looking for it in, in the second image, then, that, then you wouldn't require that, because the, the, two, the two images aren't on, on the same then they don't have the same status if you. Okay, uh, and then what you get, if you write down what that means, is that, uh, so here I've swapped C1 and C2, and I've, okay, I've written the inverse as X of Y. Uh, and so, um, so uh, uh, we would require that uh, this holds, and now you can change variables uh, to, to write this integral over omega one, Right, so I use x instead of y, and so therefore I get c2 of y of x, c1 of x. This, this is the inverse of this, and then you have to put a determinant in there for the change of variables. 
And so what you find is that uh, that uh, this holds if and only if um, of C of C1, C2A is of C of C2, C1, A inverse times the determinant of A. Another possible requirement. Okay. So for example, you could, you could do the following. You could take of C to be a function of A alone, and then a function that depends on A only through the determinant of A, and, uh, and with uh, a C of A being non-negative and isotropic and satisfying this invariance condition, which corresponds to inverting the, the reversing the, you know, swapping the um, images, and a C inverse of zero is SON, and then the F is non-negative. It satisfies this condition, again, coming from swapping images, uh, with, uh, with uh, this being zero if and only if uh, C1 is equal to C2. So that would satisfy uh, those conditions. In particular, you could take the F to be 1 plus delta C1 minus C2 squared, or, or you could take it to be this. Um, and they're both, um, they're both uh, convex functions of delta, which, which so delta is standing for the determinant. That turns out to be useful in applications. OK. Right, so the first thing you might ask is, uh, does this minimization problem have minimizers? So, so, uh, so we're going to suppose, first of all, that omega 1 bar and omega 2 bar are diffeomorphic. So there's uh, an invertible C1 map, up, C1 up to the boundary, such that the inverse is also C1 up to the boundary, which is a, uh, omega 1 bar to omega 2 bar. We're going to take a, a p that's bigger than the dimension, and we're always going to work in, in W1p for p bigger than the dimension, so that by Sobolev embedding, everything's going to be continuous up to the, up to the boundary. So, so we're going to look, we're going to minimize in this set script A, which is W1p maps, that, such that y is a homeomorphism of omega 1 onto omega 2, and the inverse is in W1p. At this time, of course, W1p and omega 2. So that's that's the set of admissible maps, and uh, so now we have to make some hypotheses. So, um, a C is going to be defined on our, on, on what I wrote down its domain before. We'll say it's non-negative and, and finite uh, on this. Um, so, provided the determinant is what, provided the, the matrix is positive determinant, it will it will be finite. Uh, a growth condition that it grows it's bounded below by a multiple of a to the p and det a a minus one to the p okay for all c and d and a now this is uh, interestingly uh, this implies that a c blows up as the determinant goes to zero okay so it's a little application of Hadamard's inequality for matrices to to, to show that um, that, that this that this is bounded below by a multi, by the by the power determinant of a to the one minus p over n, and p is bigger than n, and so determinant blows up as so so this 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 term here blows up as the determinant goes to zero. So if c blows up as the determinant goes to zero, and so that's what's going to uh, help make sure that the map is invertible to stop the determinant going down to going down to zero, because if it goes down to zero, the integrand will be infinite. Okay. And then uh, we have to uh, assume some kind of convexity uh, condition, and traditional in this field is to assume that it's, it's polyconvex, so that um, with respect to the gradient, um, it, it, it is a convex function of the minors of the matrix. Okay, so. So I, and, and I'm going to separate, so this is an n by n matrix. It has one n by n minor, which is the determinant, of course, and then it has all the other minors of lower order. I'm, I'm going to separate off the determinant as one of them, and I, I write the, all the other minors as j of n minus 1a. That's the list of all minors of order less than or equal to n minus 1, and uh, the z sigma n of them, all right? And so the assumption is that not that a C is a convex function of A, that's not allowed. 
but um, but that it's it's a it can be written as a convex function of the minus of a. So uh, that's the third hypothesis, and the fourth hypothesis is that c1 and c2 are L infinity functions. So uh, that's um, okay. it's a very weak hypothesis on the on the on these maps c1 and c2. So I mean, you, 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 you certainly would want to allow C1 and C2 to be discontinuous. You know, say a black square with a white background or something like that. Okay, and uh, so under those hypotheses, there, there does exist uh, an absolute minimizer in, in A of, uh, of I. And uh, so how is that proved? Well, it, it follows the usual pattern for proving existence of minimizes in nonlinear elasticity for a polyconvex stored energy function, but there's, there's uh, just some extra issues. Um, so first of all, we're going to use a change of variables formula, uh, which works under our hypotheses that we're, we're in W1P, so that um, if, you, um, if you want to integrate over y of e, phi of z, it's the same as the integral of e of phi of y of x times the determinant dy, because y, remember, is, is, is uh, going to be one to one. Uh, and uh, so this, this formula holds um, uh, for any measurable e and for all L1 uh, phi whenever one side is meaningful, right? So in particular, if you put phi is equal to one, then you get that the measure of y of e is just the integral of the determinant, which is exactly what you, you want, of course. Okay, so that's used in the proof, and um, and it follows from that 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 c two of y is a measurable function of x, right? And and independent of the representative of c two. So you might wonder whether the integral is well defined, but this is this is this this makes it well defined. Uh, because if you think of C2 as being discontinuous, it's, it, you, know, you, you could imagine having some problems. But anyway, the integral is well defined using that change of variables formula. And uh, okay, so we're assuming that uh, they're diffeomorphic. So, so we take such a, we take y to be the diffeomorphism that shows that there's something in A. And you take a minimizing sequence, and with corresponding inverses, well, I'll call them the uh, xi j of y, and then. Uh, you use the um, you use the coercivity condition uh, H two to 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 give you a bound on the on uh, y j and on on the inverse uh, xi j in W one p. You're bounded in W one p. You abstract a weakly convergent uh, subsequence for each of them, and then you uh, you write down the statement that c j is the inverse of y j. Right, so. So yj of xcj of z is z, and xcj of yj of x is x, and then you 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 use the compact embeddings of w1p in, in c0 to pass to the limit in this equation, so that you get a y in a which has inverse xc. Right, so that does the in, invertibility. Now the next the, the other thing you need to do is um, a lower semi-continuity of the integral if you know about the Direct method of the calculus variations, and here you use the, the weak continuity of the minors, so you you know that all these minors converge weakly to the corresponding minor in L1, so that's uh, absolutely key uh, key to the proof. And, and and now you 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 what you want to do is to is to show that the R integral for y is going to be less than or equal to the limit of the integrals for y j. Uh, because that will show that um, that the y is in fact uh, uh, gives you the actual um, lowest possible value, y j being a minimizing sequence. So this this tends to the least possible value. You want to show that the least possible value is attained. And to do that, uh, um, you it's enough to show that so there are there are lower semi-continuity theorems for convex integrands. So we have convexity with respect to these last arguments, and and they and they allow you to get lower semi-continuity provided that the first arguments converge almost everywhere. Thing. 
So what you need to show is that C2 of yj of x tends to C2 of y of x uh, almost everywhere. And that's, again, not so obvious uh, if C2 is discontinuous, for example. Uh, however, there's a kind of argument using the change of variables formula and a weak continuity of the, of the determinant, which, which, which shows this. And so you, that's, the, if you like me, the last ingredient of the proof. So, so it's, it's, like, it's like the proof for standard elasticity with, with a couple of extra ingredients. Uh, what do we know about the minimizers? Nothing, more or less. Uh, and that's exactly the same as in elasticity, where we know almost nothing about minimizers. Uh, are they weak solutions of the Euler-Lagrange equation? That's not known. There are forms of the Euler-Lagrange equation which you can derive. Uh, so you can show that it's, it's a weak solution in some sense, but not, not the most sort of natural way, you know, when you calculate sort of d by d, t of i of y plus t phi, for t equals zero, for phi of test factor, you, you, nobody knows how to get that form of the Euler-Lagrange equations. And, and, and an obstacle to doing that is that we, we also don't know that the determinant for the minimizer is bounded away from zero. Okay, so the the, hype, the growth condition implies that the integrand blows up as the determinant goes to zero. Right? However, for it could be that the determinant is zero, for example, on a set of measure zero. I mean, the determinant could be a continuous function of x and zero on a set of measure zero. So that would mean that in some places the integrand is infinite. You know, you're trying to minimize an integral. Right? So it, it feels very anti-intuitive that you might want to have the integrand infinite somewhere. But we know that that, that, that happens in the calculus of variations. And, and it happens because if you have the integrand uh, infinite somewhere, you can make it smaller somewhere else, right? And therefore, overall, it can be a minimizer. And we know there's lots of examples like this. So, so that's not known, and that's, that's an obstacle in getting the Euler-Lagrange equation. Um, even more, we, we, we know nothing about uh, whether the minimizers are smooth. This is all safe for elasticity. We don't know whether the Lavrentiev phenomenon can occur. So the Lavrentiev phenomenon tells you is, is that, the, that the, the, the minimum in different function spaces is different. Right? So you might want to you know, sort of try and minimize an integral like this using finite elements or something. So when you're effectively minimizing in W1 infinity rather than in W1P, and we know that there are examples in the calculus of variations where the infimum in W1 infinity is strictly bigger than the infimum in among if you like all, all maps. And so you know you wouldn't therefore your that sort of numerical scheme won't won't find you the actual minimizer. Okay, so so here the, the, we we don't know whether, we don't know anything, and there's an extra complication that that C one and C two uh, can be discontinuous. So from a sort of rigorous mathematical point of view, um, we don't know much. Okay, so this is the real point of the talk, which I alluded to at the beginning uh, about magnification and linear transformation. So let's suppose that our two images are linearly related. Okay, so, so I'll, I'll take the, the translation vector to be zero. So I'm just multiplying by matrices now. So, so that means that, um, that for some m, omega 2 is m omega 1, and c2 of mx is c1 of x. So they're exactly the same image, except that one has been mapped by this linear transformation m. So, question is, can you choose of C, the integrand, so that the unique minimizer of the integral, in this case, is the linear map, y of x equals mx? So you want, you want this minimization algorithm to deliver you the linear map in the case when images are linearly related. Okay, so for simplicity, let me consider an of C 
which is of the form a function capital of C of A plus one plus debt A times C1 minus C2 squared. This is one of the examples mentioned before. So thus you require that for all invertible uh, Y with uh, Y of omega one equals M omega two. So here I've just written down um, of C of um, C1 of X, C2 of Y, um, uh, and dy of x, uh, and uh, it's, it's got to be bigger than the value you would get uh, for the um, for hopefully the minimizer y of x equals mx, where of course this term will go away because because c1 of x is c2 of mx, and the and the gradient is in fact uh, going to be m. Okay, so you would just get sort of c of m. So uh, what we want is that for all invertible y with this. Uh, we, 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 you know, this, uh, this should hold. No, sorry. Uh, that's if and only. Okay. That's a little bit awkward. Uh, stupidly. Let's look on what I so, so that's right. So, and also, you would like equality, equality in this, if and only if y of x is mx and, and c1 of x is c2 of mx. So, in particular, if that holds for all C1, it's going to hold for C1 is 0, and therefore C2 of y of x is 0. And so you get this very interesting inequality, which is that the average of, of omega 1 of C of dy is of C of m for all y which are invertible with y of omega 1 is m omega 1. So that's um, a stronger version of what's called uh, quasi convexity at m. So quasi convexity is the central convexity condition of the multidimensional calculus of variations. Uh, now, but how, so quasi convexity at m would would ask that this inequality holds when y of x is m x on the boundary, right? and more or less. If so, so quasi convexity of c would be that 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 this that this e Inequality holds for all m whenever y is mx on the boundary. Well, Loosely speaking, quasi convexity, I, I made an assumption of polyconvexity, but the right thing to do, in some sense morally, is to assume that you have quasi convexity. So, in some sense, quasi convexity is necessary in the line bit, but it's necessary and sufficient for the existence of minimizers. And polyconvexity is a implies quasi-convexity, and it's sort of more convenient. We've got better theorems that work for polyconvexity than quasi-convexity. But here, in, our, in this computer vision um, situation, we don't have that y is mx on the boundary. All we know is that the image of omega 1 under y is m omega 1. So it can slide at the boundary, preserving the image. Now, I, I'm going to show that we can, we can satisfy this condition. We can, if we can find an of C that will satisfy this condition for any magnification. So if M is lambda times the identity, one image is magnified, the other magnification of the other, uh, then we can, we, can, we can choose the of C such that uh, the unique minimizer is going to be given by this this magnification. So here's the here's the capital of C I'm going to use. So remember the VIs are the singular values of the matrix A. So I take the sum of the alpha powers of VI plus determinant of A times the sum of the minus alpha powers of VI. Alpha is going to be bigger than N. Uh, H is going to be a, a C1 convex function of the determinant bounded below and uh, and it's going to satisfy the invariance condition and h prime of one is minus n that's to make that's to make the um the zero set of, of c correct so we take this right so now then of c is isotropic it satisfies that invariance condition for swapping images it's non-negative and if you calculate it it's it's, it's zero set is SON, which is what we wanted, and it satisfies all the conditions of the existence theorem. Okay. Now, let's imagine that we have an invertible map 
with y of omega 1 is lambda omega 1. Okay, so so C of, C of dy, of course, is, is, is this, remember, let's go back and see what it says. So, so here we have the, so let's take the first term. So I'm going to use the AM bigger equal to GM inequality on this. So I've got V, the sum of V1 to the alpha is bigger than N times the product of all those V1s, VIs to the alpha. But the product of the VIs is the determinant. And similarly, I'm going to use it here. So if you do that, then, we get that C is big equal to n times det dy to the alpha over n plus det dy to the 1 minus alpha over n plus h of det dy. And this is, we call this h of the determinant, which is this expression. And this, this expression is convex in delta. Right? So therefore, uh, by Jensen's inequality for convex functions, the average of h of the determinant is bigger than h of the average. Now, the average of the determinant is the volume of the image. So that's uh, actually h of lambda n. Well, this is the average of the volume of the image. Okay, so, so, so that's h of lambda n, and you trace that back, and you see that it's, in fact, exactly of c of lambda times the identity. So this, this, this uh, of c uh, works to deliver you the, uh, as a minimizer, the, um, the magnification if two images are related by a magnification. And also, you have equality only when V1 up to, I should say, V2, V1 up to v equals V2 equals blah, 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 uh, equals N equal, equals lambda, uh, uh, i.e. The, the, the dy of x is lambda r of x. And again, if dy of x is lambda r of x, r has to be a constant. And, uh, and then you get that the... Um, that uh, at least for generic omega one, you get this. You get this relation. So for generic omega one, that will imply that R is the identity, and hence you get the y of x is lambda x. So, um, so that's quite satisfactory. So now, what about general M? Okay. So this is this is very interesting, at least to me. Um, so now imagine that you've got. Um, uh, and of C, which is C0, and omega n satisfies some condition, which I'll come to in a second. Okay, then this new quasi-convexity condition holds if and only if of C is a convex function of the determinant. And the condition on the domain is that there are n points on the boundary, xi, in the neighborhood of which the boundary is C1, and for which the unit outward normals span Rn. So, so that includes, if you had a domain, if you have a, um, a bounded domain of class C1, it definitely satisfies this. In fact, if you have a bounded domain of class C1, and you take a plane with any normal and start far away, and you bring it until it touches the domain, then you get a point uh, on the boundary where the normal is anything you like, right? So you certainly get you certainly get that for a, d a domain of class C one, or it could be say a cube. Right, a cube has um, has uh, three three normals which uh, which span are three, for example. So that's gonna, so how are we going to do this? So what's the what's the idea? The idea is going to be. To, to choose a variation, to take, to take mx and to vary it in the neighborhood of a boundary point by sliding it a little bit parallel to the boundary. And that will, that will preserve the condition that the y of omega 1 is, is m omega 1. Right, because, you're, because you're sliding at the boundary, you make sure. Okay, so how is it done? So, so let's first of all assume that the boundary, one of these boundary points is zero, 
and that the unit out of normal is En. Okay, so here is, here's the point zero lying on the boundary. This is the vertical direction is, is Xn, so that's, the, that's the, um, the unit vector in this direction is En, and the other, the other coordinates are right as X prime. So X prime is X1 up to Xn minus 1. And uh, we're going to suppose that d omega is C1 in a neighborhood of zero. So that means that you can write the, you can write the boundary as uh, Xn is F of X prime in, a, in, in some ball um, uh, uh, centered at zero. Right? So there's some epsilon. So you take a ball of radius epsilon. And um, the, the, the points in omega, which are in this ball, are given by xn less than f of x prime. And the points that are on the boundary, which are in this ball, are given by xn equal to f of x prime. And f is, uh, is c1. And I'm going to take a p. Now, this p is going to be the vector which I'm going to use to slide. So the P is going to be perpendicular to En. So it's going to be pointing in, in, the, in one of these X prime directions or some direction perpendicular to En. So P dot En is zero. And I'm going to take a C zero infinity function such that the maximum over, uh, over um, well, that should, I should have said the maximum over um, X in Rn of P dot gradient to phi is, is less than one. This is so an old version of the talk B1. So this is this should be the maximum of x of p dot gradient of phi of x is, is strictly less than you can see where that comes in anyway. And here I'm going to now what I'm going to do is I'm going to construct what I hope is going to be a diffeomorphism of Rn, which is also a diffeomorphism of omega. Okay, so so I take a T. And I let x t of x be x plus t p phi of x over t plus f of x prime plus t phi of x over t minus f of x prime times e n. Okay, so uh, so why we do that? Well, uh, so first of all, um, x t is smooth because everything is phi is smooth. T is strictly positive, so and f is c one, so f is f is uh, Next to your C1, if you like, I suppose I should have said that. Um, and what's the, what's the gradient? Well, the gradient is the identity. Now, when I take the gradient of this, the t's are going to cancel. Okay. And I'm going to get a p tensor the gradient of phi at x over t. And then you're going to get en tensor the gradient of h. Now, h is, h is this expression inside the square bracket. Unfortunately, it's dropped off the... The bottom of the screen. So the so so the gradient of, of x sub t is is this expression plus e n tensor so the gradient of this. Now, uh, okay. So now I claim that x of t is a diffeomorphism and that x t of omega is omega, and we're going to we use the following lemma, which is that the maximum of the gradient of that h tends uniformly to zero as t goes to zero. And that's it's not difficult to show. It, it, it comes from the fact that f is c1, and the gradient of f at zero is zero. Remember that the normal is uh, is uh, en at zero. Okay, so that's something we use. And now, since we have this condition that the max, now it's written correctly, max of x in Rn of p dot gradient phi of x of t is strictly less than one. The determinant of the identity, so. So the, the gradient of x of t was, was this expression plus something that's going to zero. So I have the determinant of this. Well, the determinant of the identity plus p tensor another vector is one plus p dotted with that vector. Okay? And p dotted with that vector is bigger than minus one. So, so therefore, this determinant is strictly bigger than zero everywhere. And, um, and so, and since the, 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 the sort of the, er the other term is going uniformly to zero, we're going to have that the determinant of x sub t of x is, is, is strictly positive um, uh, for all x. And then, um, well, if we go, go back. Uh, uh, 
So here's x of t. So if, um, if x over t is outside the support of phi, so for large enough values of, um, so for x bigger than a constant times t, uh, this is zero, and, and this, is, this is zero, because uh, those terms will cancel, and so x t of x is x. So what we've got is, is a map that C1 is determinant is strictly positive, and say outside some ball, it's the identity. Okay, so if you know a bit of degree theory, that tells you that that um, that x of t is a is a is a diffeomorphism. It's also it also follows from what's called Hadamard's theorem on the, on, on globally invertible functions. So, so the degree is given by the boundary values. The boundary values of the identity. So the degree is one. And the, and the degree counts the number of inverse images in the case when we're determined as positive. So you have only one inverse image. So that proves this one to one. And, and then you use the inverse function theorem to show that the inverse is C1. OK. So. All right. So that, that, um, that shows then that, that this x of t is a diffeomorphism. Uh, and. Um, Okay, now of Rn to Rn. Now, if we look at okay, so let's go back to the um, we go back to the definition of um, of x sub t. Here it is. So now, what's x sub t prime? So I get rid of the en term, right? So x sub t prime is is x prime plus t p phi of s. So p is is uh, is in x prime. And uh, and uh, and then what we do is we take we take um, so 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 uh, x sub t prime is x prime is is what's inside there here right so this is this is actually x sub t prime and then x sub t n is x n plus this right so you see therefore that. Um, That therefore, looking at that, you get that x t n minus f of x t prime is x n minus f of x prime. So that shows that um, if um, if x is in in is is uh, in omega intersection with that ball, then so will x n. So will um, x sub t be in that in the in omega intersection of that ball, and that's what that's what enables you to show that um, in fact x x sub t takes omega to omega right so it's a it's a it's a diffeomorphism of rn but it's also a diffeomorphism of omega takes omega to omega okay now i'm going to define a, a, a variation i'm just going to take i'm going to say y sub t is m x sub t right and so now we know that y sub t is a takes omega bar to m omega bar, it's a diffeomorphism. And by hypothesis, we have that the gradient of the, 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 the average of the C of the gradient of y sub t is bigger equal to of C of m. And then you calculate what d y sub t is. Of course, you just multiply on the left by n, m, what we had for the gradient of x sub t, right? Because, okay, so that's what, that's what, um, what, uh, D of y sub t is, and the last term, remember, goes uniformly to zero, so we can more or less forget about that. And then you um, you set in in this expression, right? So if you put d y y sub t into here, then you let um, and then you let uh, x over t be z. So this will turn into a z, right? We'll get a we'll get a z here, uh, and um, well, these, these terms are going to go away to, to zero anyway. Then you have a you have to change variables, but you divide by t to the n, and so you get that. Um, and what happens to the to the omega? Well, it happen, It turns into um, x n uh, being less than zero. Of course, this is this is this expression is um, outside when z is outside the support of phi. This expression is zero, so you're integrating zero. So uh, so that's what you get. And that holds for any any C zero infinity uh, phi, and therefore it holds for any phi which is say Lipschitz um, of, 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 of compact uh, support, um, provided that uh, and and also and also we know that p dot gradient of phi of z is um, 
I mean, this holds when p dot greater than phi of z is less than one, so, so you have the same condition for this. But, and then you have to choose a phi to get some uh, information from this. Okay, so we're going to choose phi to be the following. So it's going to be this hat function of one minus the absolute value, the positive part of one minus the absolute value of xn. So it depends on xn like this. And then it depends on x prime as a function h of the radius, the, the absolute value of x prime, and the, and the and h of r is it's one on between minus l and l, and it's uh, it goes down to zero linearly at at minus l plus d and l plus d, and after that it's it's zero, and you shove that in, and uh, you calculate the you calculate the gradient of phi of x so. This has a, an x prime part, which is this. Okay, so to, to take the derivative with respect to x prime, of course you, you leave the, the uh, positive part of one minus x n alone. Now to differentiate h of the radius, you get h prime and then the derivative of the radius is x prime over the absolute value of x prime. And then in the x n slot, you, you leave h of, mod, h of r alone and then you get you you just get one actually um, if if x n is between uh, um, um, minus one and zero this bit is outside the domain okay and uh, and since um, p dot e n is zero the gradient of, of phi of x dotted with p so you don't see any of this because that's as p dot e n is zero uh, this is going to be less than um, so this term is in absolute value less than one this is this is um h prime is less than um uh one over one over d and you can take the absolute value out so provided that d is bigger than the absolute value of p our condition on the gradient of phi will be satisfied and so uh so then you shove this in so what do you get you get well you you integrate with respect to xn xn goes from minus one to zero uh, but 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 actually the integrand doesn't depend on x n because because h prime is one there right so so actually this is just this is just multiplying what's the rest of the by 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 one and it, and and um, now the gradient of phi is zero uh, except um, uh, well it, it's it's uh, it's sorry. the um, so so um, so the, the radius has to be less than l plus d otherwise otherwise h is zero. And so, so in, in between, um, so when the absolute, when the radius is between minus L and L, then, um, then uh, uh, we, we have that um, H prime is, is, we have that H is one, right? So we just get M identity plus P tends E N minus this. And that's all multiplied by the, by the N minus one dimensional measure of the ball of radius L. And then the other bit, is just bounded by a constant times um, uh, l to the n l plus d to the n minus one minus l to the n minus one. So that's of order l to the n minus two. So then you divide by l to the n minus one and let l go to infinity. This term will go away, and so you get that um, this. Right? So finally. Uh, we've um, we've got this uh, addition that that of c of m into identity plus p tensor e n is bigger equal to of c of m if uh, p dot e n is zero. So this is kind of sort of intuitive if you think of the of, of sliding in the direction of p. It should be you should be you should it should be minimizing with respect to sliding in the direction of p at the point zero, and that's what this is actually saying. Now, now, you can do this at any boundary point. In particular, you can do it at the points where the normal is new, the points xi, where the normal is new sub xi. And the, the, so these are the points in the, in the condition on omega. So there were n points xi where the normals were new xi and the new xi span Rn. And the P has to be perpendicular to the new of Xi. So you either do the 
calculation again, but then it's a little bit awkward because you because the coordinates are slanted and so on. Or you can you can actually deduce it from what I did here by by taking a by by rotate by taking taking a, 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 a rigid transformation that takes the boundary point x i to zero and, and and the normal to e n. Okay, and then you you apply the previous result and you get this. Okay. Okay, so now here's a little uh, lemma of group theory for, for you know maybe. <laughs> um, so suppose you've got n vectors that span R n, then any uh, matrix with determ any n by n matrix with determinant one can be written as a finite product of matrices of the form identity plus p k tensor nu i k. There may be more than n of these products here, but, but they're all of this form with pk um, orthogonal to nu i sub k. So this, um, this is an easy consequence of a known result that SLNR, that's the set of n by n matrices with determinant one, is generated by advections. In other words, so advections are of a matrices of the form identity plus alpha ei tensor ej with i not equal to j. So to get this, you take a you take a linear map that takes say 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 new i to ei, and it turns out that the orthogonality condition is is is, is maintained. So so uh, okay. So now, so how are we going to do that? So we know now that this is true for each of the as the xi's, right? So we're going to apply this apply this lemma. Okay. So now suppose I've got two matrices M and M prime. So unfortunately, it's obscured there, but such that the determinant of M is the determinant of M prime. So that means that the determinant of M inverse M prime is one. So by the lemma, you can write M inverse M prime as the product of matrices of this type. And so now you write a C of M prime is a C of M, M inverse M prime, that's obvious. So now you, so that's M times this product, and you just take the factors out one at a time using the inequality until you get a C of M. So therefore, a C of um, uh, M prime is bigger equal to a C of M. So the same thing shows that a C of M is bigger equal to C, C of M prime. So that says that the determinant of M is equal to the determinant of M prime, of C of M is of C of M prime. So C is a function only of the determinant. And it's a, so it's a function of, of the determinant and it's continuous, it's easy to check. And um, now uh, star, our, our inequality, certainly implies quasi-convexity in the usual sense. And it's a known result that if you have a function of the determinant, that is quasi convex, then that um, function has to be uh, convex. And conversely, if H is convex, then you, you, you get star by Jensen's inequality, as, as we did before. So that's really more or less it. Uh, so then it means that if star holds, then a C can't satisfy this growth condition because it only depends on the determinant, right? So that makes it a not very uh, good function for uh, minimizing because you have no control over the determinant you're doing uh, over the gradient only over the determinant of the gradient and so i i think that might it might be better in this application to minimize something like this where you you you, you have a function that depends on c1 and c2 and the determinant may be convex in the determinant that's probably not necessary plus the second gradient of y squared and you you can prove Minimizers exist for dimensions n less than or equal to three, and and minimizers of uh, and, and, and minimizers of linear related images for this functional are linearly uh, related. And so, just as the very last thing, so you can do if you want to compare parts of images, then you can you can regard um, P one as a template image, P two as the target image, and then you could, for example, um, minimize. Are integral with the constraint that um, y omega one is omega two replaced by y omega one is contained in omega two, or you could you could um, minimize over subregions which are which are of the which are linear 
linear okay, um, translations plus a, a magnification times a rotation of omega one with the magnification between two limits uh, and maps taking omega one to um, omega tilde. So, so that there are easy sort of modifications of the existence theorem to to do that, or you could take you could take landmark points. You could you could also require that. There are n landmark points in omega one that have to get mapped to n landmark points in omega two. So these might be features that you want to want to pick. Okay, that's uh, that's it. I think. Uh, you said that uh, it's more natural to take a writing context function, uh, but in this case, you probably don't have uh, this. You can't uh, impose the condition that uh, the function blows up and determines. Mm -hmm. the quasi yeah. convexity that allows the integral to be infinite. So there is a there is a paper in 2015 of Yang Christensen where he has some kind of um, some kind of theorem that applies in that situation, but there's there's always some awkwardness. So the problem is we don't have really a good a good lower semi-continuity theorem under quasi. I mean, okay, so even the definition of quasi convexity when the function is infinite is is a little dodgy. There are several different possible definitions. I mean, for example, you could you can suppose you can say one definition, which is probably good, but but not very easy to handle, is that uh, you say that the that the function which is allowed to take the value plus infinity is quasi convex if it's the sup of everywhere finite quasi convex function. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that gives a bit of a flavor of state. Or you can define it in terms of young measures, or but there's lots of different. But it's kind of messy. Mm -hmm. Uh, you mean is it, 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 uh, but, but by something that grows as yeah. eight of some power yeah. or something? Yeah, yeah, you could do that. That's right. So that's right. So the the uh, Chebby first scale of lower semi continuity theorem doesn't work. Understood correctly, what's going on? You um, you have two images, and you suspect that they are linearly related. Um, you minimize a functional from one of these sides, and you find the linear transformation that relates them. It's so a linear linear relation. What you know? Suppose that your suspicion was wrong. Suppose that you mm -hmm. suspected they were linearly related, but the transformation was more mm -hmm. subtle, subtly non-linear. What, what would happen? I don't know, it's a good question or not. not a to, uh, definitely a good question. There should be a linear theory. I mean, there's a could be a linearized, a proper linearized theory too. So you want, you want, you want that if the images are nearly linearly related, then the minimizer is nearly linear. Yes. That's the yeah. For sure, that must be true, but, but it's probably not even hard to prove. Uh, not hard to prove. Okay. I want to ask a question. Maybe it's a very easy question, but what will change in the image if you change C1 or C2? What do they represent? Did they represent the that's is that the real image? I mean, that's that's uh, that's the that's the um. But one of them is the is in the domain. One of them is in the. That's right. So so uh, so um, I mean, in the in the pictures of Edinburgh Castle, mm -hmm. it would be uh, at each point x. Uh, um, it would be uh, the colors. You'd have three. You'd have three. Mm -hmm. You'd have three okay, functions okay, to find okay. uh, red, green, blue, or something. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, John. That was a great talk. <laughs> uh, we will be in the common room to have some coffee or tea.
It's okay if you've got a clock, but I do that on once a day. But there are lots of boards, which is very nice. See? Two, lots of screen, four, lots of boards, six, yeah. eight boards. I mean, you can do the whole lecture with eight boards. Yeah. It's not because you've only really got four. So. <laughs>